cover uh, just 10 verses, but I truly believe that today, as I do every Sunday, that the Lord really has something uh, in store for us, right? Listen, you hear us say it all the time, that there is nothing like when we gather together as the church, right? The body of Christ. There's nothing like it, just an amazing design uh, that Jesus has left behind for us. I want to also say happy Father's Day to all the fathers in the room. Uh, Happy Father's Day. This day comes around every year. But you know, I love to see a godly man leading his family, discipling his children, falling in love with the kingdom together. I just love to see it. You know, church, oftentimes we think as fathers, this is a reality. We think that it's the church's job to lead our families or the church's job to disciple our kids, although the church plays an important part in that. Listen, fathers, I want us to know that we are leading our families, journeying toward the kingdom together. For myself, there's two things that stick out on Father's Day. And we've already talked about one today. It's, it's a reflection on just how awesome our God is, our Heavenly Father. I think about that every year. I think about that all the time, but especially on Father's Day. We serve an incredible God. The other thing that sticks out to me uh, is just a reflection on myself. And, and, and I mean that in a way as I ask myself every year that this day rolls around, am I being a godly f- uh, father? Am I leading my family in a God-honoring way as a father? I ask myself that uh, every uh, year that this day rolls around uh, since I've had a family anyway. So I hope that you might be reflecting on those, th- on those same things as well. Of fathers. Maybe you haven't. Maybe you haven't thought about those. Maybe you have. I want to encourage you to do that and let that soak up and stick in your mind uh, as uh, we go throughout this day. Listen, church, I want to also ask every one of us to reflect for a moment. As you sit there, ask yourself, what does a healthy church look like? What does a healthy church look like? Have you ever asked yourself that? Ask yourself, how do I, meaning each and every one of us here, play a part in being a healthy church? Have you ever asked yourself that? What does a healthy church look like? Am I contributing to being a part of a healthy church? You see, it's not just a superficial gathering on Sundays that we come to and turn it into an event. But ask yourself that. As we look at our text this morning, the Apostle Paul is going to give us clear instructions on what that looks like. You see, Paul, uh, if you've been with us uh, through this letter that he writes, is is taking us through a journey uh, of present to future. Okay, he spoke to the church at Thessalonica about a life pleasing to the Lord, the coming of the Lord, the day of the Lord, judgment day. But Paul quickly uh, turns back in this moment to the right here and right now. He begins to give the church final instructions in this letter of what it truly looks like to be the church, be a healthy church, what that looks like. He's reminding them that they have lives to live with one another. They have a mission to pursue with one another. Listen, I don't know about you, but this is why the love uh, for the Word of God has grown such exponentially uh, in my life in the last several years because it is so real and relevant today. Listen, right here, right now, think about it. Paul is writing this letter to the church at Thessalonica thousands of years ago, right? But yet it still remains real and relevant right now, right here at Kingdom Chapel in the year 2020. It's relevant, it's real, it's living. Listen, that's amazing to me. I hope that it's amazing to you. We understand the value that we put on the Word of God. Paul is going to address practical instruction here about everyday living in the body of Christ. That's you and I today, everyone here. You see, Paul is not concerned in this letter 
about what their building looks like or where they gather or what style of worship that they sing. But rather, Paul is getting to the heart of the church here. The interpersonal relationships and the internal devotion to one another. Paul is saying, how much do we love God as the church? And how much do we love one another? You see, the interpersonal relationships and the internal devotion. Let's look at our text this morning. Verse 12 says this. Paul says, we ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Now, stop right there for a moment. I want us to understand, church, that these next two verses, 12 and 13, Paul is speaking uh, to interpersonal relationships as it pertains uh, to the people towards the elders or the overseers, if you will. Okay, the pastors. Look at verse 12 again. He says, we ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. I want you to know that elders, overseers, pastors, Ronnie, myself, listen, we take this call extremely serious. It has to be church. A pastor, any pastor should take this call extremely serious. You see, we will hold an account, and we'll look at that later, but it must be taken seriously. The role of a pastor is also called to work. That word that labor that Paul uses literally means to exert energy to the point of fatigue. Have you ever labored in your life? Listen, I have. I can remember when I was 15, 16 years old, hauling hay in 110 degree heat. It was labor. We were exerted to the point of fatigue. You see, what Paul is saying here is that a pastor is not afraid of sweat and hard work. Labor. We've said since the beginning here at Kingdom Chapel that we I have always and will always practice servant leadership. Listen, uh, I'll never ask you to do anything that I'm not willing to do myself. We desire to have everyone in the church serving in some capacity, right? If you've ever seen that church, it's beautiful. It is beautiful. This is the heartbeat of the church moving and doing ministry in your communities, in our areas, in your neighborhoods, equipping the saints for the work of ministry. You see that labor church? Listen, a pastor takes his calling seriously. He labors, and Paul also says he admonishes. Now that word admonish uh, literally is translated to, to put in the mind of or to warn. Okay? Admonish. You see, a pastor's calling is, is not to lord or domineer. Control, we'll see that in a moment. But a pastor's heart is a calling to labor, to work, to admonish, or to put in the mind of the believer what Scripture shows us about holy living, or to admonish one about sinful behavior. To urge someone, church, to keep their eyes on Jesus. Not to fall victim of this world. Listen, it's a sinful broken world you see the labor that's involved here keeping our eyes on jesus look at first peter chapter 5 verses 2 and 3 peter says this shepherd the flock of god that is among you exercising oversight not under compulsion but willingly as god would have you not for shameful gain but eagerly Verse 3 says, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. You see, church, we don't lead under being forced into anything. Not under compulsion. We don't lead for, for shameful gain in some way. But willingly as a call from God. Not out of our own aspirations. Not controlling Not asserting our own will over anyone out of arrogance, but a call. You see, a pastor leads, he works, and he admonishes. That's what Paul is is saying here. Look at verse 13 now as as he goes on. Now remember, church, this is still Paul addressing that relationship between the people and the pastors or the the elders, the overseers. 
He says to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. He goes on to say, be at peace among yourselves. Now, church, remember, this is, this is directly from Scripture. These are not my words. I want you to know, church, that, that church is all around us. Right here at KC. Listen, the, 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 the ministry, it just, it just doesn't happen. Okay? It takes labor. It takes hard work. It takes commitment. It takes admonishment at times. These are things Paul is talking about. But listen, Paul says that they are over you in the Lord. You see, what it's saying there is that it's not my show. It's not Ronnie's show. We talked about that this morning. But yet a call from God that the Lord has entrusted us with. The commentary we've been reading notes this. That under the watchful eye of God, a pastor leads, keeps watch over, and joyfully cares for his church. Likewise, out of obedience to God, the people follow, respect, and honor the leadership of their pastor. You see, Paul is not telling the church to esteem them highly in love so that they can elevate their status or so that they can elevate their title or to put them up on a pedestal and build their egos up. But Paul rather says to esteem them highly in love because of their work, their labor. You see, church, but you have to understand that's why we practice servant leadership because respect must be earned. It must be earned. You see, Paul understands the need for the relationship between the people to the pastor, if you will, to be a very God-honoring, healthy one. I want to tell you something, church. This is not always the case. That's a reality. This is not always the case. That's why Paul put, finds it so important to write in this letter. Paul wants to address these things. You see, Paul uh, desires for the church of Thessalonica to be a healthy one, to be a thriving church. You see, any elder anywhere, any pastor anywhere over any church, myself, Ronnie, we will give an account for each and every one of you. I want you to know that. Scripture tells us that. Look at Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. The author says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keeping watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. You see, church, listen, you need to hear me out. We are in no way here to lord or domineer or to control. No, that's not it. That's not what we're saying here. Paul is saying, rather, here to shepherd as we will give an account. Do you understand the seriousness that comes with that? You see, that's why Paul urges the people to respond positively to the shepherd by recognizing his calling, respecting his work, and resting in his leadership. You see, Scripture shows us all throughout the need for strong, sound leaders and teachers. Anywhere you look in this world, there needs to be good leadership. Sports teams, corporate America, whatever it is. You see, church, we are to remember that we've said this for many, many times. Ronnie's mentioned this many, many times. Church, we are under shepherds to the chief shepherd under shepherds to the chief shepherd. Now, in the next few verses, Paul begins to transition here. He begins to transition from, from people to pastor, if you will. He begins to transition uh, to people to people. That would be everyone in the church, all of us together as a whole. Look at verses 14 and 15. Paul ends at uh, the end of uh, verse 13 saying, Be at peace among yourselves. Verse 14 says this, And we urge you, brothers. Now that word brothers means brothers and sisters, okay? That's all of us as a whole. We urge you, brothers, admonish the idle. You hear that word admonish again? Encourage the faint-hearted. Help the weak. Be patient with them all. Verse 15 says this, See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another 
and everyone. You see, Paul understands here that there will be some brothers and sisters who walk irresponsibly. Listen, that's the truth. That's been the truth everywhere I've ever been in my life. That is the truth. That's exactly why he tells us to warn the ones who are walking irresponsibly or to admonish them. You see, it's not to control. He goes on to say, encourage the faint-hearted. That word faint-hearted literally means lacking courage or timid. You see, what Paul's saying is comfort the discouraged. Listen, that might look like sending someone a text during the week, having a cup of coffee with someone, calling somebody, saying a few encouraging words. Listen, we've been uh, teaching that and saying that for weeks now at KC. Let the brotherly love continue. Listen, church, in no way am I trying to, trying to simplify the word of God here, but these are very, Paul is being very pastoral in this moment. Okay, he's given us very matter of fact ways, instructions that we are to be the church as the body. You see, it's not up to just Ronnie, myself, the staff, but it's up to all of us as the church. This is what it looks like to be a healthy church. Listen, it's not just on Sunday morning. This is a huge part of our gathering. But it's Monday through Saturday as well. You see, if it was only on Sunday, then we would be no more uh, than, than just an event with some religious undertones to it, right? We have to know what it looks like to be a healthy church. Being the church in community with one another always. That's Paul's heart here. You see, Paul uh, goes on to say here, he says, help the weak. He understands that there will be spiritually stronger ones among them and also spiritually weaker ones. This also is the case everywhere I've been in my life. God has made us in our own uniqueness, right? We all are, are at different times in our spiritual walk, journeying to the kingdom together. Paul understands this. Listen, the church at Thessalonica was no place for the fainted heart. It was a dark place. Ronnie uh, spoke about that. It was idolatry. Sexual immorality, false teaching, it was a dark place. So we see the need here, why Paul finds it important for the spiritually strong to stand beside and even carry, help carry the spiritually weak. Listen, sometimes we need to get down in that pit with our brother and sister and help walk them through that. That's what it looks like to be the church. An author puts it like this. It says the church should support these weak brothers as beloved fellow strugglers, not to desert them as ignorant or unimportant stragglers. Man, that's pretty good, isn't it? Listen, I've been guilty of that. I want to tell you, church, I have been guilty of that myself. But Paul says no. He says help the weak. Stand beside them spiritually stronger do what you can do to help your weaker brother or sister that's what paul's saying here the last part of that verse says be patient with them all listen church how can we practice all these things how could we act on all these things paul is speaking to the church about if we have no patience with anyone right how can we do that you see we serve a patient god don't we we serve a patient God. Now listen, church, in no way am I saying that we serve a patient God so that gives us a license to sit in our own sin or sit in our own mess or that that's okay. But listen, the reality is, is that we are messy people. There's no denying that. Listen, Ronnie mentioned it last week. God loves us. He hates our mess, right? And God is patient with us. So Paul is saying we ought to be patient with one another as we journey together. Verse 15 uh, shows us that no one repay anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. You see, last week, uh, Ronnie told us that vengeance belongs to the Lord, not to us, right? Vengeance belongs to the Lord, not to us. To us, You see, Paul is telling the whole church there to refuse 
to retaliate. How many times have you wanted to done that? How many times have you wanted to do that? How many times has someone offended you and you want to offend them back? How many times has someone cursed you and you want to curse them back? Paul says refuse. The fact of the matter is, church, is that Christians, believers, we are able to hurt one another, right? That's, that's a reality. That is a reality. Sometimes we think that all believers, all Christians everywhere, we all get along in this perfect harmony. And that we always love one another. But sadly, this is not always the case. This is not the case. Listen, in fact, I would say that we are able to inflict great hurt on one another. That's a reality. We are able to inflict great hurt on one another. You see, Paul, that's exactly why Paul tells us this. Remember, Paul is speaking and giving them instruction on how to be a healthy, thriving church. We cannot control how we are treated, but we do, we can control how we respond to one another. Listen, this is something that the Lord has worked with me in my own life for several years now. Because I was one that I wanted to fire back quickly. I wanted to repay evil for evil. But the Lord has steadily worked on me with this, continues to work. As we see here in our text. Listen, in other words, we do our part and then we trust God to do his part as believers, as the church together with one another. Listen, church, this is not elementary truth. This is solid truth here that Paul finds it important to put in this letter to the church. Look at Romans 12. Uh, We're going to look at verse 14. We're also going to look at 17, 18, and 19. Verse 14 says this, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Listen, I'm going to tell you, church, there's been times I wanted to curse somebody that persecutes me. I'm being honest with you right now. But Paul clearly tells us, Bless those who persecute you. You say, Bobby, I've heard this. I know that. Listen, we need to live this. We don't need to just hear it. We need to live this. Look at verses 17 and 18 and 19. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Remember in our text, Paul said, be at peace among yourselves. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. You see, vengeance belongs to the Lord, not to us. And just as Paul says, we are to do good to one another and to everyone. I love how he puts that, and to everyone. You see, it's not just people here. It's everyone. I think we can agree with that. Look at everything going on in the world right now, church. To everyone. We've seen in our text that Paul addresses our interpersonal relationships as it pertains to people to pastor and pastor to people and also people together as a whole. Now Paul transitions to the last part of the text. This morning as it pertains to our personal devotion. Remember those interpersonal relationships and our personal devotion? Paul addresses it all here. Look at verses 16, 17, and 18. Paul says, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. i got to tell you, church, I love these verses. I love these verses. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. One pastor puts it like this. The more we pray, the more we rejoice. When prayer and joy are married, their firstborn child is gratitude. I love that. I love that. You see, Paul says, give thanks in all circumstances. Not when we feel like it. Not when we've had a blessing come our way. Oh man, thank you Lord for this blessing. 
Not when we're in a good mood. Not when we've had a good day at work. Not when things are going well in our life. But rather Paul says in all circumstances. Listen, that will only come when we never stop praying and never stop rejoicing for who our God is and what he's done for us. You say, Bobby, that's, 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 that's easy for you to say, man. I got a lot of things going on. You don't know what I have going on in my life. I say, you know what? You're right. But God does. God does know what's going on in your life. And the text says, this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. You see, it doesn't say for some of us. It doesn't say for only a few of us. It doesn't say that it's only reserved for pastors or deacons or people that do good in their community. But the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And I love that. Church, let me tell you. Listen, I work full time away from here at FedEx. I've been there 17 years. So this is not my full time job. I drive for a living. I've spent many, many nights down and out. Down and out. It happens to all of us. But I turn off the radio and I go to the Lord in prayer. And in a matter of moments, I'm rejoicing and giving thanks to who my God is, what he's done for me, what he's done for my family, what he's done for my church family. I'm giving thanks for what he's doing in your lives when I hear and speak to you about the fruit coming about in your life. You see, that's what prayer does. We begin to rejoice in the Lord and who he is. And we give thanks in everything, all circumstances. You see, Paul, in no way, is telling us to use vain repetitions in our prayer here. No. Paul is not telling you to never, stop, uh, uh, never cease to pray so you can check off a box and, and, and make it a legalistic duty, right? Paul in no way is saying that. Paul is not telling us to be praying 24 hours, 7 days a week, Listen, that would be impossible, right? But rather, go to the Lord, speak with Him, meet with Him, learn how to pray with persistence. Give thanks in everything and not just for everything, church. How many times are we guilty for that? That we want to give thanks for everything. But when when tragedy hits us or hardship comes about, We're so quick to say, God, why'd you do this? Why'd you do this to me, Lord? No. Paul says, give thanks in everything. Paul also says to rejoice always because of God's Spirit in us. The Holy Spirit. Look at verses 19 through 22. Verses 19 through 22 says this. Paul says, do not quench The Spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. You see, Paul wanted the church there at Thessalonica. Paul wants us to experience more joy in the Lord and knew that they needed the power of the Holy Spirit to build them up, and for them to experience that. You see, the Holy Spirit is what's been given to us here on earth when we step into relationship as we journey to the kingdom. Paul says, do not quench the Spirit. Listen, what happens when you quench your thirst with a bunch of water? You don't want that water anymore, do you? You're done with it for a moment. Paul says, do not quench the Spirit. Let the Spirit move and work in your life. Do not put out the fire of the Holy Spirit. Listen, I would say that we are all guilty of this. We want to we feel good or whatever or meet with the Holy Spirit on Sunday. No, Paul says, do not quench it. You see, joy, persistent prayer, and genuine gratitude are all evidences of the Spirit's work. They're all evidences of it. Paul goes on to say, do not despise prophecies. Now, he says, do not despise or do not look down on or treat with uh, content, the contempt the teachers or 
or, 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 or pastors from teaching the inspired word of God. You see, Paul says, do not despise him. Paul understood that the church will only be as strong as its commitment to preach, teach, and obey scriptures. Paul knew that that's how, where their strength would come from. But look at that next verse, church. He also tells the church, but test everything. This is important, church. This is very important. You see, the, the church there, the church uh, now, churches all around us in, in all areas, all over the world. Listen, there are people teaching false doctrine. There is false teachers all around that. Listen, we looked at that when we were in Galatians for a moment. That is a reality. You see, that's why it is so important for us, church, you and I, us together, to know the Word of God. Listen, Ronnie said it time and time again. Listen, test what we tell you. Test that. The only way that you will be able to do that is for you yourself to know Scripture. We do that so we can examine the message to test, to see if it truly is the Word of God. To see if it truly is pleasing to the Lord. Paul says, do not despise these people, but test them. Test them. You see, church, for the believer in the room, our lives must be viewed through the lens of Scripture. That's why our lives must be viewed before we do anything, before we make any decision, before we go in any direction, we must ask ourselves, what does the Word of God say? Church, we need to know what Scripture says. That's why Paul says, test them. Test them. You see, it is so easy to sit under a teacher or a pastor or whatever and you might think this guy sounds excellent. But church, we need to know if he is, is speaking the word of God. Right? We need to know that Paul says, test everything. Paul goes on to say, hold fast to what is good and abstain from every form of evil. You see, Paul understood that the church there... Uh, was experienced all kinds of evil around them. I would say that we are as well in this world. It's a broken world, right? That's why Paul makes it clear, hold fast to what is good. Hold fast to sound doctrine. Hold fast to brothers and sisters in Christ. Abstain from every form of evil. Listen, we saw earlier in the text uh, a couple weeks ago that there was idolatry sexual immorality, all of these things. Paul found it important. Abstain from every form of evil. You see, the things that prove to be good, we must embrace them. The things that prove to be good, we must embrace them. And things that are evil, church, we must stay away from them. Listen, I know that sounds simple, but how hard is that? Listen, there are things that trap us in that we don't even realize have trapped us until we get so far in that we have to beg and plead with God to pull us out of it. That is a reality. That's exactly why Paul says, hold fast to what is good. The author of the commentary says this, God called his people to develop deep and meaningful relationships with one another. He says he desires for the church to be more than a superficial gathering of the people. He says he desires for the church to be a family. A family devoted to one another and to him. You see that interpersonal relationship and that internal devotion there, church? He goes on to say, for a family to function properly, each member must do his or her part. You see, for us to be a healthy church, it takes all of us, not just a few of us. 
not just some of us. Church, as we open this morning, I ask you to reflect on that. Am I doing my part to, 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 to play a role in being a healthy church? Being a healthy church takes all of us. You see, that's exactly why I told you that we desire to have everyone here serving. We desire to have everyone involved. That is truly amazing when you see that. Listen, I pray, I pray, church, that we desire to be a healthy church. Just as Paul laid out these practical ways for us to live that out together. I pray that we desire to be a healthy church. Listen, maybe you've been in church all your life, and maybe you haven't been a part of a healthy church. Maybe this is the first time you've ever been in church in life, and you're not sure what a healthy church is or, or, or this. Listen, Paul lays it out for us that we desire to be a healthy church. Each and every one of us playing his part, doing his part, playing a role in being the church. That's exactly why Paul says to esteem those highly in love that labor among you. Paul understands how intensive that work is. Paul understands the need for one's to love one another with great devotion. Paul understands the need to not, uh, 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 to not be quarreling or fighting among one another. Paul understands the need for the church to be at peace with one another. Paul understands for each individual person to hold fast to what is good. To hold fast to what is good. To abstain from evil. You see, Paul is writing this letter to the church. He understands the need for what it takes for this church to thrive and to be a healthy church. Listen, as we close and we sing this last song, I pray that this might be our reflection this morning. Maybe as we sing, we ask ourselves, am I doing my part in contributing to the family of God. Ask yourself that. Ask God that. Am I holding fast to what is good? Am I abstaining from evil? Am I truly abstaining from evil? Listen, is my relationship with God devoted? Is my relationship with one another God honoring? Do I love my brothers and sisters in Christ? Do I love my church family? Do I love others, period? Ask yourself this this morning as we sing. Listen, we will never, we will never be the church that God has called us to be outside of these walls, in our community, in our neighborhoods, if we do not value God and our own family right here. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, Lord, I just thank you for your word, Lord, that we are able just for a moment to reflect back on Scripture, Lord, and just truly get practical ways, practical identities of what it looks like for us to be the church that you've intended us to be the bride of Christ. Church, I pray that we are a healthy church. Lord, I pray that we are a healthy church. I pray that we first desire to be a healthy church. Lord, I pray that we embrace this scripture. But Lord, I pray that we don't only hear it, but we act upon this. I pray that we understand that this is not just Sunday morning, Lord, but I pray that we understand that this is every day, always. Lord, we give you all the glory for what you're doing right here at Kingdom Chapel. Lord, I thank you for each and every person here this morning. 
Lord, I desire so much to be a healthy, thriving church as you've already been moving and working here, Lord. But Lord, I know that you have more for us. Lord, we give you all the glory for what you're doing here. And Lord, I pray that we will be devoted to you. I pray that we will love you. I pray that we will love Jesus. That we will walk with Jesus every day. And Lord, I pray that we will be devoted to one another. So that we can truly experience right now. Truly get a taste right now of what it's going to be like when we go to the kingdom. Lord, we love you. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Church, we can stand and sing.